Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography Special Interest Group. And of course, thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of our Eclipse series. So it looks like we have another fantastic crowd here. We have uh, over 170 people uh, joining us, not just from the US or Canada, but uh, very likely from around the world. And again, we are all very grateful uh, that you could join us for this very special presentation uh, because for, for, throughout most of the Eclipse series, we, you know, we have one speaker. We did have one speaker that gave two talks, uh, but tonight we have w uh, basically one presentation with two speakers. So without uh, uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, both of them right now. So Xavier Jubier is an engineer and currently uh, works as an IT manager from a multinational French company outside Paris, where he is currently joining us uh, live at roughly 2 a.m. from his hospital bed. So we really uh, uh, give an extra amount of uh, uh, appreciation and gratification to uh, Xavier for joining us uh, uh, from the hospital. We hope it's nothing terribly serious. Uh, but Xavier uh, started to get involved with solar eclipses in the early uh, 90s, and he maintains a website related to eclipses. And if you've ever used the Google... Um, the 2024 Google uh, Interactive Eclipse Map, that's from Xavier. So uh, just got to thank you for that right there because that's been a tremendous resource for us. And then we, off, then we also had uh, Fred Brungis, who's an electrical engineer living in Warrensburg, Missouri. And he is the co-owner of Daystar Filters and the founder of Moon Glow Technologies. And so Xavier is the creator of Solar Eclipse Maestro. Fred is the creator of Eclipse Orchestrator. And I'm a PC guy, so I've used Eclipse Orchestrator uh, both in 2017 and last year for the annual eclipse. And I've had nothing but good things to say about it. It's been tremendous. So that's why I wanted to invite both uh, gentlemen here to, to walk us through how to set up their software so you can best take your pictures without ever having to look at your camera on Eclipse Day because that's what I did. Never even looked at it and it worked flawlessly. So without further ado, we'll begin with Xavier uh, straight from his hospital bed. So again, thanks for joining us, Xavier. We really do appreciate that. Well, good evening to everybody or good morning from wherever you are. Um, I think, you know, we, uh, we have to share with uh, Fred the presentation. So I think uh, we start, you know, both. And then we um, uh, either, I mean, um, start with Solar Eclipse Maestro and then go um, on Eclipse Orchestrator or, or the reverse. As you prefer. Whatever you guys want. You, you guys go ahead and take over. It's, it's your show now. Go first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, but go first for for your presenta presentation. Oh, yeah, you should. want me to put my slides up? Well, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, okay. All righty, let's see. How because we... that, that, that part, we have to share it. Okay. Yep. All righty. So I've, I've got a stock presentation I use for Eclipse Orchestrator, and that talks about me. And then we can talk about Eclipse phenomena. And, you know, both of our softwares work kind of in the same way. They use a very similar scripting language. And the idea is that there's all these different things going on during an eclipse and you you just can't physically turn your camera's you know buttons fast enough to change the exposure times up and down and left and right. And so it was a huge problem and and you know both of us have developed software to, to automate it, make it a lot easier and and hopefully so you come away with more photos than you would have if you just were doing it by hand the old fashioned way. Yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Xavier. Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, both of us also, we first did it uh, for us. Yeah. And of course, we decided to just, you know, give it, uh, um, I mean, to the public. and, and... Yeah, I, I started in 2001. I used a, a paper uh, script and I was just reading off the paper. Okay, change it to this, change it to that. And, I, you know, you don't enjoy the eclipse at all when you do that. 
And so then in 2002, I started to write what, what, what became Eclipse Orchestrator. And then um, I went a different direction in 2003 because we were going to Antarctica where it was very cold and I wasn't sure a laptop or a computer would work in Antarctica. So I built a, a battery powered timing trigger for the cameras. That's what's in the picture here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. And, you know, when I showed it off in the airport, it, it Jen says to me, Fred, you built a bomb. And, you know, it didn't occur to me until then that, you know, we were doing something kind of crazy here. And and so then after that, it was back to the software and, and to make it full time, you know, work with a laptop and, and make it easier to use. Yeah, for me, uh, it was, uh, I started, in fact, in 06. Um, I started the maps in 04. And the fact is, uh, I mean, for the public, it was available uh, in 08 for Sol Eclipse Maestro. Yeah, I don't remember the first year I released mine, but it was some, something similar. You know, I was using it mostly for me for the first few years. And then, um, you know, this is the 2003 picture I've got up. And Xavier, I think you were, if you can see my cursor, you were off the screen to the right at that picture of those of us in the line there. Yes, I, I was quite far away, yes. Yeah, I think he, so, you know, we saw that the eclipse was going to be close to the horizon. And, and so he took off running up up the hill to try to crest the hill and, and see it better. And I stayed put. Yes. And I'm kind of glad I did because I had a, other eclipse chasers in front of me. And you can see this is the Japanese artist Kagaya. And he was setting up and taking pictures of the eclipse, and it just happened to be in the frame. And it was it was really fascinating how people responded to this picture because those of us that were there, like I think right here in the red is David Levy. You know, he saw this photo and he said, "Oh, Fred, you got it just right." Other people look at this and go, "Oh, that's that's too photoshopped. It's too fake." And and so there's there's kind of a difference in processing, and, and you know, and then that's one of the things you have to think about when you're setting up photos is is what are you trying to convey? Is it art? Is it science? Um, you know, what's the story you're trying to tell with your photos? I think, um, you know, one of the other things I'll say is just an introductory, you know, we, we talk a lot about the, the Corona, the, the prominences in the background here, I've got our, our standard Corona composite that everybody likes to do. And, and that's what this software is good at. You know, it's, it's real good at stepping through a whole bunch of different exposures and, timing them perfectly so you get the diamond ring in the right time you, you get the earth shine photo in the right time and then you can composite that later the, the the important thing about that is it frees you up for the serendipitous moments because the stuff that really gets viral or liked or everybody talks about later is usually the odd weird thing you know it's a it's a dog wearing eclipse glasses that can get more likes on facebook than the the picture you slaved over for months to to make a beautiful result so you know use the, the software to, to free yourself up and look for other fun things going on during the eclipse is, is a big point I would make. But the key there is also to practice and practice and practice again. It's yeah. uh, some yeah. people, you know, they always wait until the last minute. Yeah. Then it's, it's a no go. I mean, there is no way you can make it work properly. If you don't practice uh, at least, let's say a month before. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, it, it, it kind of shocks, you know, maybe people don't realize I'm an eclipse chaser first too. And so, you know, our phone will be ringing off the hook while I'm away in, you know, Zambia or, or Africa or somewhere where I'm not getting those phone calls or answering those emails. So I usually turn off the, the ability to purchase the software a few days before the eclipse when there's nobody left in the office to, to do customer support. Yeah, I, the worst thing is to wait till you're on the plane to try out the software and to find out you're missing a driver or a cable or something. The the worst is indeed, I mean, all those people also trying to, I mean, reach to you and uh, at the last minute, there is nothing you can do. Yeah. Yeah. So practice ahead. I mean, it's good we're talking about this here in January when we're 79 days out. So people have time to try it out, ask questions, figure it out, fail, correct it, move on. You know, this is, this is, I mean, I go crazy with eclipses because it's a one shot deal. You only get one chance. You have to get it right. And, and so there's a much higher bar of preparedness than most people are used to that you have to meet. And one thing also is that people have to understand that they need to spend time on it. Mm -hmm. um, they are not going to, I mean, learn to do everything uh, in a matter of minutes. 
it's yeah. just impossible yeah this is complicated stuff this is you know like when we get in and show the software there's there's a billion settings and it's real easy to to get one exposure timed wrong and it starts a domino effect down the line where then you don't have time for the next exposure and then you don't have time to the next exposure and then your buffer runs full and then the, the camera falls over so we'll talk a lot about um all the things we've seen go wrong over the years i think zave do you want to fire up a, a maestro at this point or do you have any more opening remarks uh no i think it's it's mostly it maybe we can have some questions also before we begin or i don't know some people may have some questions to to ask i don't know well other than the question while you're getting fired up what um, myself and tim did a lot of work on for the 2017 because we were part of the mega movie okay i'm collecting data for that yeah. and um we use your software and what we and just the big thing about preparation is about a month beforehand get a big tarp laid out in your driveway or in your living room or wherever you're going to be set up all of your equipment from scratch as if you're building it on the day of the eclipse every cable every adapter pc usb whatever sd card whatever else you need build it all as if you're going to image and check everything's working and then when you tear it down, lay it out in the tarp, and then what's on the tarp is what you pack to bring with you. Because so many people turn up and they're missing a cable for this and adapter for that, and their whole day is just is just gone from doing that. So preparation we found was we, like we had really great success. This is my totality, by the way, from 2017. Okay. So we have Liam, been... Liam, I'm going to cut you off here. Let's save it for questions uh, only, yep. and let's uh, save the comments till the end. Thank you. So Xavier, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, fire yep. away. Let's try. Can these softwares only be used with Nikon or Canon cameras? My orchestrator is just Nikon or Canon, and I'll talk about that when we get into the later. In my season. case, in my case, it's most uh, manufacturers. Um, I would say but one, and I'm going to to say but one uh, because I mean with Sony it's just uh, next to impossible. Uh, they they do nothing like uh, any uh, other manufacturer, so it's a uh, it's pure madness in their case. Mm -hmm. um, so in my in my case it's it's mostly of course uh, Nikon Canon because it, those are the two uh, main uh, brands. But uh, then, I mean, you can have, uh, I mean, Fujifilm, uh, Panasonic, uh, whatever. It, it works. Uh, uh, but how about the OM-1 from OM system? I know, I know it, it does work, although it's, it's far from perfect because, again, I have uh, no access to uh, those cameras. So that's the other problem. You know, when you need to support a camera model, uh, you have to have, you know, some physical access to the camera. You have to have time to check uh, what's working, what's not working, try to find ways to, to make it work. And the problem is, of course, um, if you uh, have no way of getting those cameras, then there is no way you can really do, uh, I mean, a great support of the, a specific model. Uh, they, they all have, you know, some differences. So this uh, makes everything difficult. The same, for example, when you uh, switch from um, an ARS um, series and to the R series on Canon, or the same for, for Nikon, the old you know, DSLR and now the new uh, uh, Z series, it's, it's completely different, in fact. Uh, and there's also one, um, I think, difference with uh, Fred in my case. I think Fred is using... Uh, the Canon SDK and the Nikon SDK? Yeah. Okay. In my case, it's my own SDKs. So, uh, okay, I, I do use the Canon one because at the beginning I had no Canon uh, cameras, so it was easier for me. Uh, but nowadays, it's my own uh, SDK. For Nikon, it has always been my own SDK. Uh, and it's the same for all the other, you know, cameras. So, um, in my case, it, it's there is even... Uh, 
uh, an additional layer of complexity because I cannot rely on um, SDKs that are made by the manufacturer. So let me try to share my screen. Is it working? Yes. Okay. So as you can see, I mean, the screen is, is quite similar to the one that you saw um, in the Fred uh, slide. Um, so uh, first thing, I mean, you always have, you know, those um, information about the Eclipse. You have to select, of course, the, the Eclipse first. So you have a whole uh, list of Eclipses. You don't need to, I mean, touch anything uh, there. Um, the only thing is, you know, you need to select one Eclipse. That's it. Uh, of course, you could always uh, want to modify the Bessonian elements. But, I mean, honestly, you don't need to. Uh, the ones that are provided are the good ones. So don't try to mess up this part because oh, even though it's possible, it's not going to bring you anything. And we will come maybe... Um, uh, to this part a bit later, uh, when we, for example, show that uh, you can change the uh, solar radius, um, different parameters. So usually don't touch anything there, just select the eclipse. As you can see, you also have, you know, some partials, even or, or historic, historical ones. So you can make, you know, studies on, on those eclipses. You can use also an external file. Uh, but again, this is really for, you know, power users. So uh, on a regular basis, you don't need to do this. You can check the current Bessonian elements. So if you just want to have a view of those elements, check the values, you can do it, no problem. Uh, I, I would say the only parameter that you could adjust is the delta T value. Uh, because this, I mean, uh, will allow you to have, you know, uh, better contact uh, times. Because if this value is off, and it's always a prediction that you have to make into in advance, then you can have a shift of the eclipse path by a couple hundred meters, sometimes a bit more, depending on uh, if, if your value is, is really off or not. Roughly, if you are one second off, uh, it's about 900 feet shift in, in longitude. So you can imagine uh, if you are on the edge, for example, of the eclipse path, then uh, you have to be careful. If you are close to the center line, doesn't matter at all. So in general, I mean, don't touch anything there. There is no, uh, there is no need in fact. So first thing is always um, select the eclipse that you want to. Uh... Then uh, the other thing is the observer location. So there you have different uh, choices. You can input the data by hand. You can connect a GPS uh, unit, uh, either by USB or uh, it, it works also um, with the Bluetooth. So depending on the model that you have, you just you know plug it in and that's it. You, you wait until you know you have a lock and you're good to go. Uh, in my case, uh, there are some uh, time zone, elevation, lookups. Um, but you can also, of course, input it uh, by hand. You can save multiple locations, restore the locations. So I'm not going to, you know, enter into the, de the details, but it's, you just, you know, click on it, select. Uh, there is no, nothing um, uh, too complex over there. Um, I have chosen in uh, a location in, in Mexico, in Mazatlan for next April. So then, uh, let me check one thing. Okay, then also you have uh, the time. You can make simulations because, you know, when you practice with the software, you have to simulate, in fact, the eclipse time. Otherwise, it cannot work. So you have two, two main modes, current time, which you will use during the eclipse, and otherwise simulated time. So there you can type any update that you uh, that you wish. Of course, in our case, we should uh, select 
the one of the eclipse. So let's let's put uh, so So as you can see, you have a diagram of the um, eclipse with the sun and the moon in front. In my case, you have different um, ways to uh, to display, in fact, uh, this diagram. Uh, there you see, I mean, the, the moon is is uh, partly transparent. It's showing the I mean the whole moon, but the, the part that is uh, not behind the sun, not in front of the sun, is transparent. Okay, it's just, uh, but you can you can of course have it you know fully um, opaque. Uh, you see also that the edge of the moon is not perfectly um, smooth because I, I do uh, take into account, uh, in fact, the valleys and the peaks, even on this display. Of course, it's really small, but uh, it does, you know, show that the moon is, is not a perfect, you know, sphere. Um, okay, so you have different uh, settings that you can, of course, change. Uh, for example, if you want to show the moon surface, so this is the real moon. Uh, it does um, the display of the moon. You does uh, change with the, the libration, so it's exactly as it is in in reality. Of course, you don't you don't see the surface of the moon like this, but or you can just back. Which one? Yeah. Also for the sun, you can have you know the sun with without limb darkening, for example. Anyway, I will let you uh, check what you can do. Um, it also shows, I mean, uh, the, the 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 red uh, tick mark is, for example, the north pole of the sun. Uh, the green north pole of the moon is in uh, in uh, green. <laughs> And and you have also um, the ecliptic that is drawn. Okay, it's not you don't see it too well there, but it's the the dotted uh, line there. And the uh, solar equator is the those two white uh, tick marks. Anyway, everything is explained in fact um, in the online uh, help, and the one that is also uh, inside the um, application. So you can just you know open it. Uh, and check everything there. So, um, location with indeed. Um, so there, nothing else to do. Uh, then, one thing that is important uh, is also to select uh, the default photospheric solar radius. Uh, one thing that most people are not aware of is that. Uh, usually, what you see is that the, the eclipse is shorter than most prediction. Uh, why? Is because, in fact, uh, all the eclipse maps, by default, they use uh, the standard, the official solar radius, which, in fact, for solar eclipses, is um, not big enough, which translate to, in fact, longer duration than the real one, which means that the contact times that you get, in fact, are not exactly correct. And they can be off by about one second if you don't choose, in fact, the, the right radius. So this can be done there. By default, it's the EAU uh, radius, which is the official one. So if you check there, for example, you see from this location, you have with the the limb um, the lunar limb correction, you have four minutes, thirteen seconds, point four se seconds. But if you use the solar radius that I recommend, so this one nine fifty nine dot ninety eight arc seconds at at one AU, you see that the duration is reduced by about two seconds. You lose about one second, in fact. Before second contact, 
and after first fraud contact. So to uh, I mean uh, when you add the both, it's about two seconds. So it's it's a huge difference. I mean if you want to optimize, in fact, um, uh, the picture you are taking for the Belize beach, for example, you should use this enlarged solar radius. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating that, you know, it's just in the past five or 10 years, we've figured out the sun isn't the same size we thought it was since 1891 or whatever. So it's it really kind of used to be a fringe topic to discuss that the sun is, oh, it's not the, same, the size we think it is. But, you know, Xavier pointed it out to me in, in a video I took in 2017. It was like, oh, my gosh, the, the different radius fits the, the observed stuff way better. So the, the stuff that's in the textbook is wrong. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's it's a it's a hot topic, I would say. Uh, sadly, uh, during the past two years, we lost um, a few people that uh, were ready to engage in in, in trying to, I mean, uh, amend, I would say, the official value. So now I, I'm sure it's going to take more time, but one day we will have to come to it. Uh, the issue there is also that it also depends on. In fact, on the definition that you take uh, for the solar radius, because depending on, on the definition that you choose, uh, in fact, this radius can be different. So it's, it's it's a complex matter. But anyway, for eclipse photography, you should, in my opinion, use this enlarged radius. This will give you, I mean, uh, the best contact times possible. Uh, the accuracy, I would say now, if you use this enlarged radius is about at most two tenths of a second. So I think it's good enough. I mean, for most uh, uh, users, uh, of course, you have to input the, the, the correct location. If you are off uh, by, let's say, I don't know, uh, a thousand feet, for example, clearly it, it, it um, I mean, the, the error margin is going to increase by more, in fact, than the, the tolerance um, um, of, of the uh, the enlarged um, solar radius. So just make sure that you have everything correct because it's not, I mean, it doesn't help if you just use the, the good solar radius and, and the wrong location, for example. So make sure you, you, uh, you do input uh, the proper um, coordinates. Otherwise, of course, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, what else can we say? Xavier, could Xavier, yeah. could you show that again, wh where that drop down menu was from and what you put on there? Setup, set up, solar radius at one AU. So the, the value I do recommend is th this one, 959.98 arc seconds. Um, I have also, I mean, done a study on eclipses over 50 years, and uh, on on all those eclipses, it, I mean, this radius is the best uh, match possible, uh, including when you have eclipses, um, hybrid ones, when uh, the, the apparent diameter of the sun and the moon are nearly exactly the same. Uh, you have, you know, many beads all around um, the moon, and it's uh, it's the only way. I mean, you can really match the, the 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 bead pattern because it's one thing to to match uh, the location, the size, uh, the brightness of a bead, but when you also match the uh, the animation, um, you know the way the way all those you know beads appear, disappear, and so on. I mean, this does tell you that your value is correct. Because there is no uh, there is no other um, explanation possible. It's not it's not a coincidence. Um, and and I mean, with I mean Fred Software in mind, this is also a good way of understanding what's really happening. Um, so um, then what else? Um, yeah, if possible, of of course you know when when you are. Uh, not close to a sunset or sunrise. I mean, atmospheric re refraction is not that important. For example, uh, 
um, next April in the US. You don't necessarily uh, need to uh, turn it on, but just do it. I mean, the, the sun is, is of course quite high, but doesn't matter. Just make sure that, I mean, all the, the correction are in fact on. The same for the limb correction. Always try to use the best one, okay, which is the uh, NASA LRO. Uh, in my case, I can, you know, select different, um, in fact, a lunar limb profile. And this is for um, historical reasons to be able to also, you know, study all eclipses, compare the data and, and uh, that's it. But I'm going to show uh, one thing. Uh, so. This is the lunar limb profile. When you do a close up. Okay, for example, here you have second contact. So the, the C2, for example, there is second contact with a smooth uh, moon. So no uh, no peaks, no, the C2. Um, We're not seeing anything on the screen there, Xavier. The pop-up oh. never came. Oh, okay. Do you want to try to unshare your screen and maybe share it again, maybe? Uh, let me check. I'm going to, oh, maybe. That way. Ah, there we there we go. Now we yes. see we, we see like a graph. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. So All right. it, it's it's the lunar limb profile, but uh zoomed in. Okay. So C2 second contact. This is with the I mean smooth lunar limb. The C2 um uh, iPhone is with the the lunar the the, the I mean, you are being corrected with so peaks and, and valleys. And you see, of course, they, they are not exactly at the same position. The, um, the yellow um, uh, uh, line and is the sun, okay? It's the position of, of the sun. So, for example, if, if I go early, you see the sun. <laughs> If I go later, the sun, of course. So you you can check exactly which peak on the moon, which valley is going to, in fact, uh, be the last one or the first one to uh, to touch the sun, the limb of the sun. Okay. So you see that there it, it, it's correct. I mean the the computations are correct. It's the same thing for third contact, which is there. So. For example, I'm going to go straight to it. So you see the sun again, and I can do the same. But you see this time, the valleys and the peaks on the, on, on the moon are rougher. And so the, the, the timing and the distance between the, uh, the smooth limb and the, the limb correct and contacts, they are quite, uh, they are wider apart, in fact. So anyway, you can you can I mean zoom in, and in my case, uh, yeah, I cannot do uh, no, I cannot show it there. But anyway, you can you can also. I'm going to, oops, let me go back. Um, I have to go. to take yeah, that one. So let me try to check. Um, how come I cannot talk okay. Let's do that. Share. Okay. Do you see this new uh, graph? Yes. Okay. That one, on that one, I can. So for example, show also the Watts profile, which is the, uh, I mean, original one that was uh, made uh, in fact, uh, mostly by hand, you know, from uh, observation. So, so you see, I mean, between the uh, LR one and the Watts one, you have quite a few uh, differences. 
it's it's not exactly uh, the same. So you can imagine that the contact times, of course, if you use a different uh, uh, profile, are going to be different. So make sure that you really use the latest, uh, the highest uh, resolution one, okay? Because depending on on uh, the eclipses, the differences sometimes you know can can be quite um, quite important. It could be half a second, maybe a second. It can happen. The same if I add also the Kaguya, the Japanese uh, probe one. You see, it's much, much, much closer, but there are still, you know, some some small differences. For example, this peak doesn't really exist on the Kaguya one. There, for example, it's not exactly the same. For the contact times, okay, in, in this case, it doesn't, you know, change much. Um, so, uh, let's... I want let's close this. Oops. Do you still see my screen? No, we don't. Okay. Let me check. Each time I close a window, I on the screen apparently uh, hmm. drops. Okay. Um so all, all this is available in, in the display uh, menu. Uh, I mean, you have different uh, tools. I guess you don't see, of course, the... Let me, I don't know why it doesn't... Share. We see that pop up. Oh, that, that okay. So let me... So this is a basic, uh, basic tool. Uh, but it does give you an idea, of course, where the contact time, the, the contact location, you know, are located. Um, and you see, of course, the, the valleys and the peaks. So the, the, the profile, it's basic, but I mean, it does give you a good idea. You know exactly where, for example, the north of the sun is, the north of the moon. Um, anyway, I will let you have a look. Um, the other thing is, you can have some animations. It's basic, but it, again, it does also give you an idea of uh, the bees that you can expect from any location. They are going to reappear on the other side. That's it. So, uh, so again, depending on, on what you want to do exactly, for example, um, I mean, most people, they, they are only looking for duration. The more duration for, for them, the better. Uh, my opinion is that uh, I don't think it's the best way to do it because personally, um, for example, getting a nicer beads, Bailey's beads, I think it's better, even if you lose, uh, let's say, 10 seconds. It doesn't matter. You know, you have four minutes. So at one point, make the right choices. Uh, the same. Um, few people are ready to go um, on the edge of the path. Uh, but depending on, 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 on what you want to do, for example, if you want more chromosphere, if you want to have uh, prolongated uh, Bailey's beads, then go on the edge. Okay, you have less corona. Again, it's it's a choice. You have to 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 choose whatever you want to do. And for this, you have new simulations, so you can, for example, this one. You can have a close up. You can even zoom zoom in. Uh, so you you see an animation, a real time one. Okay. So even before uh, going to the location, you will know exactly what you should see. The, the blue layer that you see, in fact, this is how to measure uh, more accurately the solar radius. It's, uh, again, we are speaking about it, but between, in fact, uh, the photosphere 
and the chromosphere, there is a thin layer, which I personally call the mesosphere. And it's, it's I mean, this thin layer has some uh, specific uh, physical properties and its color is blue, okay? So if you, I mean, have um, uh, the proper equipment, you can photograph it. But the thing is, to be able to do this, you have to do um, a whole sequence of images, um, a burst, for example, and at the right time. Otherwise, not possible to see it because it, it, it does last only at most a couple of seconds. But to measure the solar radius, for me, I mean, is, is the solution. Uh, so you can, for example, go around third contact for the animation, same thing. See the bees, not yet. That's it, it's coming. You need to move that window into the oh. center of your screen there. Okay. There, there. And you see the this blue layer, but it's, yes. it's only visible, I mean, a short time. So of course I, I you know let it play, but if you want you can also I mean play it by yourself manually. Uh, and it's possible also to I mean save, make a movie, whatever. Um different things. You can also uh, decide to use an ND filter, for example. So of course it's going to be different because with the filter you see you don't have the blue layer it's it's still you know going to give you the position of the beads anyway there are different things that you can uh, you can do um you can for example exaggerate i mean the the peaks and valleys on the moon I use uh, you can for example use a bigger solar radius to uh, zoom in as well so anyway you can you can play with it um everything is in real time and um, all I can say is that it, it does match uh, what is shown on the pictures. If you use, I mean, the, the enlarged uh, solar radius. If you don't, then you will see some, uh, some differences. Uh, okay, what else before, um, before we get into uh, the photography part? Yeah, some people are interested also, for example, to understand the, the geometry of, uh, of the eclipse. Um, so you, you see, in fact, the, the lunar shadow. That pop-up is behind your screen as well. Again, okay. Uh, Xavier, that is because you're sharing the app, not your desktop. If you share your desktop, that problem goes away. Uh, what should I do then? Unsh stop sharing, and when you go to share, choose desktop and not the app. Uh, but I think that's what I did. Let me check. Yeah. Okay. You can do a new share. Just yeah. There you go. Is there it there? Go. Okay. Yeah. Now that's, we see everything. That's much okay. better. Okay. So let me. So you see the 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 red circle. Yes. Moon shadow and okay. So you can have an animation. Some people, you know, uh, they they get a better understanding of on, you know, what's really happening uh, in three D. Because sometimes you know people ask uh, questions such as, oh, but uh, I don't I don't get it. 
how come uh, over there it's sunset? It should be sunrise. Uh, it, it's just because they don't understand, in fact, the, the geometry of, of the eclipse. Um, and, and in this case, it's simple because uh, it's also, um, uh, it's not in the polar regions. But of course, when you have uh, um, eclipses in the polar region, uh, things uh, do get more difficult to understand because you, you, you think that the eclipse is in is in reverse. And some people just, you know, don't get it. Oops. So anyway, you have, I mean, lots of um, things to, uh, to play uh, with. Um, some also, you know, basic uh, sky charts. Um, if, if um, for example, there is a comet, I think Fred also does it. Uh, we do display the position of the comet. So by chance, if, um, for example, uh, next April, uh, there is one, it will be um, positioned properly on the sky chart. Uh, okay, then I think it's it's about all. Uh, anyway, there are different things you can, you know, play with. Um, I mean, the same, you have, you know, weather maps in my case. Um, it, it does, you know, match mostly what, uh, for example, G. Anderson is, is, you know, giving. It's different data, but it's, it's close, I mean, to, to what Jay is providing. It's lower resolution, but it does, you know, still, you know, give you um, an ID and you can change different parameters and check exactly, you know, what's happening. So, um... Okay, so what else? Uh, yeah, also in a similar, similar time, in my case, you see uh, the time flow, I can stop it. I can just put it um, at the regular speed or I can even go faster. So let's say 300 times faster. Okay, so you can, I mean, make lots of simulation. And this is what you have to do, in fact, when you practice. You have to do it multiple times uh, until everything is running uh, smoothly. Uh, you can also select, you know, for example, uh, the time at different events. So for example, third contact. As you can see, I, I also, you know, display the, the solar corona behind. Of course, it's not the one that you will see during the eclipse. Most likely, uh, this time, since we are nearing the solar maximum, it, it will be uh, different. And I don't adjust, you know, for this. It's just, you know, to, to show where the plumes, you know, are um, to give you a, a better idea. The same you can also, for example, display... Um, if you have an equatorial mount, uh, uh, where exactly the, the frame of the camera will be. So, uh, so I think it's about all. Um, yeah, you can also, if you want to adjust, you know, by hand the contact times. But to be honest, I don't recommend uh, you do this because, I mean, if you select uh, the eclipse, if you enter the proper location, if you select uh, the correct uh, solar radius, there is no reason why um, those times uh, should be off. So unless you want to do something uh, really special, don't, uh, don't touch those um, times. You can have also, I mean, built... Uh, tables with local, you know, circumstances. Um, there are different things you can you can do if you want to, I mean, plot some graphs, some data, some, I mean, know the, the, uh, the Umbra velocity, for example, I mean, different stuff. Um, there are lots of, lots of things you can do. I mean, it's, it's not only for, um, uh, it's not just for solar eclipse, you know, photography, it's, it's much more than that. Uh, there is also, for example, one menu, I'm going to show it, but um, 
I mean, people don't have access to it. You have, for example, for, for Eclipse flights, you have, in fact, one part that can uh, generate uh, all the data for the Eclipse intercept, intercept, you know, from uh, from the aircraft. Uh, of course, I have not chosen the proper time, but for example, let's uh, try something else. I think it should be earlier. Yes. So you see this is a simulation. So you can do different things, know exactly uh, what to expect from the aircraft, uh, where to um, best intercept uh, the eclipse. Um, there are lots of things you can uh, you can do. It can it can plan the whole, uh, in fact, uh, the whole intercept uh, course, uh, and it does provide uh, all the data for for the uh, flight system uh, uh, management. Um, you can create, you know, have all the waypoints. Uh, tell from where you are starting, different things. Um, so this is uh, this is private. That part is, is completely uh, private. So now for the uh, cameras. Um, so to connect the cameras, you have two ways. Uh, and I think for Fred, it's the same, either USB or through the, the serial port. Uh, the fact is, when you use the, the, the serial port, you also have the uh, USB connection. Because one uh, one problem we are facing with most cameras is that um, when you um, when you change, in fact, a setting, it's not instantaneous. And uh, when you fire the shutter, uh, contrary to when you when you do it manually or through a, a serial cable. When you do it through the USB, there is a big uh, lag, in fact, because the camera, you know, is, is busy. So in fact, this is uh, the way most manufacturers do it. Um, it's, I don't, I don't understand why they do it because I don't see any uh, technical reason. Uh, but anyway, what we, uh, what we observe is that, um, Usually, we cannot, for example, fire twice in, let's say, one tenth of a second when, do it, when doing it through the USB port. If we use a serial cable, then it works. So uh, some people uh, have to use both a USB cable and a serial uh, port cable. In my case, there's a, a difference also is that uh, I can also, for example, on most cameras, uh, change who the USB cable, um, the, um, um, the, um, ah, the, 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 um, ah, how should I say it? Uh, the, the speed of the camera. Um, not not the shutter speed. The um, ah. f stop. The aperture. No no no. Um, oh boy. ISO. No no no. <laughs> the right speed. The buffer. No, the, 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 no, 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 the the single um, CL. CR. Frames per, frames. Oh, like continuous yeah. shooting speed. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's, it, that's, it, that's, it, that's it. Correct. Yes. Uh, so in my case, I, I can, you know, change it. Okay, it's possible. So the software, you know, can uh, can do it on, on many cameras. So this can also allow you to, for example, uh, do a burst uh, and then uh, do the regular, you know, sequence, um, single, single pictures. Um, so there are different ways to um, for sometimes to do things. You know, there is not necessarily only one way to do it. It depends on, on the camera. It can depend, on, of course, on the software. Um, it, it can also depend. One important thing is that uh, whenever you can, do get the fastest uh, memory card, for example. Uh, because this 
is a huge limitation. Often the camera, of course, is, is limited. And uh, even if you use the fastest card, still the camera is going to uh, limit what you can do. But anyway, don't try not to use, you know, those cheap, slow cards. Try to get the, faster, the fastest ones, particularly with the cameras, for example, that have lots of uh, megapixels, because the more, uh, of course, the, the bigger the files, uh, and so if you have a slow card, it's going to take ages before um, the pictures are written on the card. Um, so, I mean, this is, you, you have to optimize all the parameters that, uh, that you can. If you have a fancy camera, get also a fancy memory card. If you have a low-end uh, camera, then okay, it probably won't matter. The fact is, I, I, I would say, then don't use the software because it doesn't really make any sense. Unless you just want to uh, be, you know, hand-free, enjoy it, uh, get a few pictures, then fine. Um, so uh, each uh, each camera that, that you connect um, has to be, uh, in fact, referenced. In my case, you can, you know, have an association between the camera serial number and a name, and this is the name that you will use in the script. Okay, so each camera, you just make the association. To do this, it's quite simple. I'm going to connect a camera so that you see how it happens. So it's the same for Fred. I mean, you, you have the hardware, you know, configuration window. So I connect the camera. You see, it's finding the camera. That's it. So the camera is identified. It already has a name because it already has an association. Uh, so let me, so for example, if you look at yeah, there, so you see it, it did recognize the camera from the serial number and then it gave it its name by default. So once the camera is identified, every time you connect it, its name is already given. You, you can, of course, you know, decide to, to change it and, and put something else. But the, the key there is that in your script, you have to give the camera a name. So if you don't associate uh, the name with the serial number, every time that you connect the camera, you will have to do this, you know, uh, naming um, operation, which Honestly, it's complete madness. And also, if, for example, you have a software crash or any problem, you just have to connect the camera again and nothing else to do. If you, if you install this, a fresh copy of the software, you've never connected a camera before, will there be anything in the list of camera reference? Or no, is it created no. when you add this? No, no. Okay. It's only when you do it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and you can, uh, you know, clear the... Uh, the list also, uh, for example, you can decide to delete everything. Uh, Xavier, we know that <clears throat> Solar Solar Eclipse Maestro will handle up to four cameras. Yes. Fred, yes. how many will uh, Eclipse Orchestrator handle? Um, I wouldn't go above four. I, I don't encourage people to use more than one because it gets so complicated to interleave the exposures and, and you get a scenario where if one camera stutters, it can make all the others fall over. So I, I'm, I try to preach one camera, one laptop. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with, with Fred. Um, although in my case, um, I, I mean, I know lots of people who have done with four cameras successfully. I personally, I did test with two. I did test with three. I didn't go beyond because I had no... Uh, no other camera to, to test with. Um, but again, I, I would also recommend not to try to put too many. Uh, I mean, the, the only uh, thing I would, I would say is, anyway, you have to check, practice, but, uh, okay, let's say, for example, you have two, two fancy cameras. I think you will be mostly fine. Then, Let's say you had the third one. If that third one is also um, doing, taking too many pictures and, and uh, too quickly, 
you might end up into trouble. Uh, you never know. Also because when you practice, the problem is you don't practice on the real um, eclipse. And the data that is um, from the eclipse is not the same than the data that you will have, I mean, get when you take uh, uh, pictures when you practice. Of course, uh, you can try to, for example, um, shoot uh, on a light bulb to try to mimic more or less, you know, the eclipse, but it, it will never be the same. So the data not being the same, you're not exactly sure of the uh, the time it will take for the pictures to be written on the memory card. And I mean, there are so many factors that you cannot really simulate that you might end up into trouble. The more cameras, the more potential for problems, uh, that's for sure. The same if you have, I mean, a crash, anything, well, then things can really um, go wrong. Uh, so again, uh, practice. I mean, if you, you want to use four, why not? But it's, it's up to you. And if you haven't um, practiced a lot before, I would not do it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, having four cameras each going 10 frames a second. You know, that's not what this feature <laughs> is designed for. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, also, I was successful in 2017 with two cameras, mm. and and I'm just crazy enough to think I I know it well enough to do four. And I'm I'm actually working on a script right now that appears to be close to working. Um, obviously, not doing a real live eclipse right now, but I I think I'm I'm just gonna go for it. <laughs> see yeah. see how yeah. it goes. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, if you see something is going wrong, you can always, of course, uh, disconnect one camera. You can, I mean, in fact, you have to be aware about the potential for problems and you have to be ready to, I mean, <laughs> uh, you might actually want to rehearse it with a slow memory card that's going to take longer to buffer out and then up for the eclipse, switch to a yeah. faster one. That yeah. might be one way to tackle it. Yeah, there, well, there are different ways. Mm. I suppose a fundamental question is, let's say you took an incredibly long exposure, which you probably wouldn't do, but let's just say it was a minute long uh, and camera one fires and you're waiting for camera one to finish the exposure. Can it fire camera two before camera one is complete or is it waiting for one to complete before it starts the next? No, in my case, it, it, it can fire both camera at the okay. same time. Mm. Yeah. In, in mine, it's running in separate threads. So it's theoretically yeah. possible. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Uh, but again, it's again, t test it because also, you know, things do depend also on the cameras, things, I mean, there are so many factors. Uh, it's, it's next to impossible to, um, simulate everything to, to be sure that everything is going to work. In my case, I have control over the, since I, I made my own SDKs, uh, I know what I'm doing. But when you are using SDKs made by others, uh, there's there's nearly no way to to know for certain. So I, it's about risk. You know, what's your risk yeah. risk tolerance? Do you have to get the shot, or are you just screwing around? No. It's um, anyway. Uh, you you have to try, rehearse, uh, do whatever uh, to make sure that. In the worst uh, case scenario, um, it doesn't, um, I mean, you know, yeah, nothing worse. And uh, you say, oh, and, and of course it's too late. So <laughs> make sure that everything works at least um, at home uh, when you practice. Um, the other thing that you can do in this uh, window is also you can synchronize uh, the time. So the, the camera time will be synchronized with the laptop time, which can be also synchronized to the GPS time. Uh, and the last um, column, it's uh, when you have this, um, you know, um, serial, ca serial cable uh, connected. Um, so in this case, there are no cables. So now, for example, if I want to just, you know, fire one shot, I can test it do fire. I don't know if you heard uh, the camera fire, but it did. Uh, if there's a GPS uh, connected, it will be uh, shown there. 
if there is a okay, ball, same if you have weather station. So anyway, nothing really uh, special there, but it's 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 there that you need to uh, always go with a new camera to make the association to make sure that everything is is at least working properly. When you, for example, even on eclipse day, uh, make sure in fact you go there and test the camera. Make sure it does fire. Uh, eventually, you also have, for example, um, a short uh, test script to check that everything is working properly before you load um, your your true um, Eclipse uh, script. Because, you know, sometimes I, I have seen some people that, uh, in fact, everything was working fine at home. And for whatever reason, they mess up on Eclipse Day because of, I mean... Uh, the excitement because of, I mean, various reasons. And in fact, uh, they don't realize that, for example, uh, um, something is, is, is wrong uh, or they have chosen the, the wrong script, whatever. And then, of course, nothing works. Question on the camera time synchronization. Uh, uh, this is for a friend of mine. He does not own a USB attached GPS for his laptop, but his camera has a GPS in it. And he was thinking, can I make the camera's GPS give the information and the date and time to the computer? Or does it work the other way around? Uh, it works, in my case, it works the other way around. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, also because um, uh, personally, I recommend turning off the GPS on the camera. Why? It's because it's using a lot of uh, power, in fact, at least on the cameras that I have seen. And sometimes you can run uh, out of the battery on the camera just because of the GPS. So again, I would say, test it. It's working for you, fine. Personally, um, I think it's uh, it's a no-go. I, um, I don't want to... Uh, to have a problem. Of course, nowadays with with the the newer cameras, uh, I know that you can have, of course, uh, external batteries. It's it's pretty easy. Um, you can have a, a big, you know, battery pack, whatever. So why not? But again, it's it's additional factors um, to have problems. So I don't I don't see the use. Uh, also, because you know you know the the location, no matter what. Uh, you know that the pictures were taken from that location. So, okay, the, the time is is important, of course. Uh, but you have it, you know, with the with the application. So I don't, I mean, I don't think it's 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 really that useful. Um, and personally, I don't I don't have any. Uh, I mean, of the newer cameras. So. Um, I don't really have to uh, to deal with the problem. Um, I, I I would also say, you know, I wouldn't trust the camera because it wasn't designed as a precision timing device. You know, we really need time to better than a second. You know, we want sub-second accuracy in our time source. So, you know, do you know that Canon coded their, their code with a low enough latency to get that time data over, you know, within a few hundred milliseconds? We don't know that. We can't guarantee that. So that's why we like the dedicated external yeah. GPS. And also, I mean, every camera is different, um, so it's 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 quite difficult to to know. Um, and and personally, I think you know, uh, being being able to turn off all those uh, features that you don't really need, I mean, is best because it's it's always one thing uh, less that can go wrong. I wanted to ask a question that I think was kind of asked earlier, again, just to make sure I understand. So so if I was going to use multiple cameras, whether that's two or three or four, hmm. um, for example, uh, starting a, a take blast, you know, we're going to do a series of multiple exposures, and I want to start this at C2 minus 10 seconds. Hmm. Can Can I put into the script each camera starting at minus 10 for cameras one through two or three or four, or does it have to be a different timing for each of those cameras, if, if that makes sense? So 
Uh, Fred, you mentioned that each camera is receiving a, a separate signal. Um, am, I, am, I, am I making that clear or is that kind of confusing or? Yeah, you, in my case, you could program it all to the same time. and, and same, same, same advance, C2 yeah. minus 10 and each yeah. camera. Okay. Yeah, in my case as well, yeah. Oh, okay, good. I think yeah. that'll help some of the scripting then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But but again, it's uh, sometimes it's not necessarily a, a good thing to do this. Uh, it's I don't. Know. Again, I, I know. yeah, I mean, if like if you've got four cameras all on the same equatorial mount, you fire all four shutters at the same time, you're going to get a hellacious shake in your image. Yeah. And so, in that case, it'd be better to stagger them by a few hundred milliseconds. Um, actually, I've got but for a shutter camera. You know, shutterless is different, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I, I've hey, actually... everyone! Everyone, we're going to have to give Xavier time to wrap up his presentation here soon because we still have to get the Fred, and we'd like to try to wrap up by ten o'clock or so. <laughs> uh, okay, so let, let me try to. Um, so uh, let let let's, for example, I don't know, uh, load a script, whatever. Uh, you have some some default uh, script, but anyway, I will I will I will take uh, one. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so I mean, you have the whole you know sequence. It shows you how much time until the the next um, action. Uh, you can have some you know voice cues. Uh, uh, you have some some uh, uh, pre. Um, um, recorded ones but in my case you can also have um, some um, a voice um, um boy um anyway it, it it can speak you know any any text you want so you just you know type in the text it will speak it. Uh, so it can also tell you, okay, uh, 90, 92, for example, a 92, 92%, you know, obscuration. Uh, you have different, you know, comments to uh, to do this. Magnitude at 70%. See, for example, this is, you know, uh, computer generated. It's not a uh, pre-recorded. Pre so there are various things you can, you can do. Um, some people don't want, of course, to have any noise. Some, I mean, it depends on, on what exactly you want to, uh, to achieve. Uh, there is one thing also, when you have uh, multiple cameras, uh, and for example, that uh, you want to use live view to check uh, the focus. Uh, the more cameras you have, the more difficult it becomes. So you have to, you know, think about this because usually uh, when you are at home, uh, everything is easy. When you are in the field, everything becomes much more difficult. Um, you have to think of, about, for example, the weather. Let's say, for example, it's really cold weather. It's not going to be uh, that easy. Or even if it's very hot, same thing. Uh, always think about this because at home, everything is always nice. Uh, you're not in a hurry, so everything is perfect. When you are on eclipse day, uh, things can really uh, go wrong. So yeah, make make sure you think about this. Um, the more you try to do, the more problems you can have. Uh, what else can I say? Um, yeah, one difference. I was I was I mean speaking about it. So in my case. Uh, I can, you know, uh, change, for example, the, uh, the FPS. Um, on the Nikon cameras, I can set any values. On the Canon ones, it's it's more or less um, either the, the slow, high speed, um, or the, the signal one. Um, I mean, the, the most flexible cameras there are from Nikon, uh, clearly. Uh, all the other manufacturers, it's, I mean, doing those um, actions is far more difficult and nothing is, uh, in fact, documented uh, by the manufacturer. And this is a huge issue. 
I mean, Nikon is the only, uh, in fact, manufacturer providing uh, all the details. Uh, some provide absolutely nothing. And uh, for Sony, uh, it's, uh, I mean, even if they, I think they provided something, it would be mostly uh, useless. Um, I, have, I've, I don't even understand what Sony is doing. I tried so many things, never with, I mean, I, I could never, you know, get any reliable, in fact, um, way of, of, of making sure that the pictures, you know, were taken. Sony camera, I mean, all the cameras, but Sony, they always, for example, return um, a status. So for example, you, you send the camera a comment, it's, it's, it's telling you, okay, I'm busy or, Okay, there is an error. Um, Sony cameras, they don't tell you anything. They, they accept everything. They don't provide uh, any error messages. It's just a black box. You don't know what's happening. So yeah, if you have a Sony camera, to be honest, try to find um, another one, another brand. Just, you know, leave it there. I mean, the, the cameras, the Sony cameras are nice, but they are not really made uh, for a for use. Um, so anyway, the for all the the action in the script, you should, you know, check, in fact, uh, the help, um, the online help. It's, it's the best way to know exactly what you can do or not. Uh, one important thing is that uh, on the um, DSLR cameras, uh, in my case, you can, in fact, always leave the mirror up. Okay, so you don't need to lock the mirror and and uh, every time uh, uh, lock it up, lock it up. You can you can always keep it up, just more or less as if it was a mirrorless camera. There is only one thing you have to be careful about is that you should do this only for a short period of time. So, for example, do this only during. Uh, for example, totality, not during the partial phases. It's it's purely useless. And uh, the problem, if you if you do it, it may work, but the camera is going to heat up, and so the more noise on the on the sensor, and so it's it's. I mean, during the partial phases, there is no no point doing this. Uh, one thing also I think that is different from Fred is, uh, in my case, you have, and you see it there, you have some actions, you can do some exposure ramps. So for example, you can tell, okay, do, uh, I don't know, 15 exposures from, uh, let's say, let's say one, one tenth of a, let's say one second to, let's say one thousandth of a, of a second. And this can be done with only one uh, action line. You don't need to type 10, 20 uh, lines. Uh, but of course, it's uh, less flexible in the sense that uh, you can not do exactly uh, what you want. Uh, but still, you can you can have you know uh, different um, exposure steps. You can have different numbers of pictures. Um, so there, there's a choice. Um, what else? What else? You can also, on, on the cameras that have um, a movie feature, you can start a movie. You can also switch from pictures to movie mode. It's possible. Not all the cameras, of course, uh, um, do let you do this. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, some people also, I, I, I did add, uh, but very few people are, were using it. Um, at the time also, I was using um, as big uh, cameras. So it, it was, I mean, those were supported. Um, So I think that's about all. Maybe I can take, you know, questions and 
and then Fred uh, can. Xavier, I have a question. Yeah. I noticed that you set in your uh, hardware a camera, mm. the D500. Yeah. And then when you loaded your script, it had three cameras there, a D800, a D810, and a D500. Yes. Whenever I've done that with your software, uh, anything I have in the script that is not listed in the cameras does not load. Magnitude at 60%. Wait, wait, wait. Let me stop. You understand? Go, go ahead, go ahead. Can you, you repeat? You loaded the D500. Yes. And then you loaded your script. Yes. Your script had a D800, a D810, and a D500. Mm -hmm. When I do that with your software on my end, if I only have one camera there and I have three in the script, it does not load the cameras that are not, I mean, it does not load the script cameras that are not loaded in the hardware. How did your script load the 800 when you only had the 500 listed in the hardware? Uh, because in my case, it's already a uh, registered reference. I guess that 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 may be the difference. There is, there is an association between the serial number and 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 the, the camera name. So I guess this is the the explanation. I only saw the D five hundred in the registration. Oh no no I I I, I can check. I will. Let me check. Now you see. A10, A50, you have, there are many cameras. So I guess this is the, the explanation. Uh, yeah, one, one important thing, uh, when, when something doesn't work, you should always check the log. So, because it, it will tell you what, what's exactly, you know, happening and you should have, you know, some error messages. So that, that's one thing that you, uh, should always uh, look into. Uh, can I have one question for Xavier, if I may? Yep. Um, the big question, I suppose, everyone's probably wanting to ask: Are there any plans to rewrite so it'll run on the new M2 Max or M and so on? Um, right now, no plan. Uh, I have, I mean, no, no available resources. Uh, it's a, it's a complete rewrite, you know, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the main issue. So, um, it will most likely take years, um, given also the, I mean, um, you have to support everything you have to, I mean, it's, it's again, uh, I'm doing this on, you know, on my free time. And the past few years have the, have been quite uh, difficult, so right now I don't really uh, see how um, I could um, I could manage it. Yeah. Uh, well, you said it'll take a few years, so be ready for twenty forty five, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would hope so. <laughs> I, I guess, I, I guess by by the time maybe you know somebody will take over. Twenty twenty seven, hopefully, Egypt. Yeah, we, yeah, I would, I, I would love to. Uh, the same, you know. It's, it's. Um, although, of course, I don't uh, make this to make money. I'm not making a living out of it. Uh, I would say that uh, receiving more donations, for example, would be certainly nice. Uh, because you cannot even imagine the number of people that are asking for new features. For I mean, new cameras to be supported to I mean, it's 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 never ending, but at one point, people you know they are asking, 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 uh, and I mean the internet for example is not free, even though uh, some people you know may think it is, it's not, uh, and I would say it's the same. Uh, I'm not making a living out of it, but at one point, uh, given the time you know spent on it, uh, given uh. I mean, all the things that people are asking for, 
at one point you say, hey, uh, <laughs> maybe you should um, think it over. All right. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, we really need to move on here. So, uh, Fred, if you want to jump right into your demo, let's uh, let's get into it. OK. Let's see if we can share a screen here. All right. So I'm just going to blast through my slides real quick, just to make sure I remember all the important points. All right, not a sales pitch like Xavier was just talking about, you know, we don't make money on this. I, I charge a little bit of money just to kind of cover when I need to rent um, a camera to try out and fix a problem or if I need to buy a, a really popular new one. So, you know, it's, this isn't like a normal product where we have a big team supporting this. Like, I'm the only guy doing this. Xavier is the only one doing it there. I tried hiring help one time and it was a total disaster because this is such specialized stuff that... Um, there's nothing we can do to train up an employee to, to do this kind of work. Um, so, you know, like I, I start to think things from the top down, you know, when you want to build your photography plan, what is it you want to come away with? Corona, diamond ring, Bailey's beads, partial phases, you know, you got to think about the equipment to pull this off and the timing of when the exposures are. So it's better to formulate a plan ahead of in diving in and just screwing around sometimes. And there's lots of things you can do with the eclipse and and you know chromosphere prominences there's all these crazy things refine the diameter of the sun we were talking about this is something that just in the last few years has come up and then um that you know if you want to go and do that you need to take specific exposures so you know with eclipse orchestrator i have this script wizard where you can very it seems simple at first you basically tell it okay i want three pictures of the partial or the, before the eclipse starts and i want first and fourth contact and diamond ring and so many of this and so many of that. And, and the program will then go ahead and make a, a wizard. The wizard will make a script for you and then you can edit it. You can manipulate it. You can check it out. And so I added this in, I think about 2009, because it's very daunting to just start in a, a plain text editor and write up a script. This gives you kind of a framework that you can start with, and then you can go in and edit the minor details and, and refine it and test it and improve it. And then we've also got, just like Xavier's, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute here, you know, setting the simulations, testing, testing, testing is, is what you have to do. And so you can go simulate second contact. And this is something you're going to do over and over and over as you, as you run through it. I've got a visualizer graph to show uh, the exposure depth versus time. This can kind of help you. There's shaded regions that show, okay, the corona's in here the prominences in chromosphere, the diamond ring, the Bailey's beads. These are, this is brightness or, or kind of like exposure length. And then this is time going across in the horizontal axis. So that's another feature I'll run through real quick. Live view focusing, you know, out of focus images is one of the top three things people struggle with on eclipse day. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this, this has a metric that can help you get it focused. Um, some other features you saw in Zavi is the same uh, sun um, the atmospheric view. I've got a, a simulation of the shadow, the actual cone of the, the moon. So if you look down here, it's a little darker. And then later at third contact, it's moved off to the northeast. And if you're very at the end of the eclipse path or the beginning where the sun is right against the horizon, you can get some really neat effects of the cone of the shadow coming in. And it's, it's good to simulate that ahead of time so you can see just how, how wide of a lens should you pick to capture that effect. Um, Bailey's bead simulation, very similar to his. Uh, this is just a way to see, you know, what, what, what is the, the, the time, uh, you know, how much time are the Bailey's beads going to take? You can see from this that the good stuff is all in the last five, three, two, one seconds. So that's where you'd need to concentrate most of your photos. I've got a similar view of the, the lunar profile and it can identify which crater actually the last light of second contact is coming through. So like in this case, it's the Einstein S crater. And I think it's just kind of fun to know that that last little diamond ring is because of that specific crater. Um, just some general advice, testing, testing, testing. We've talked about it a lot. Don't do anything last minute. Don't make improvements that you haven't tested extensively. Um, the other big thing, don't take too many photos too fast. Everybody buys the new camera and it's like, oh, it can do 860 frames a second. And they want to 
program it to run that fast. And that's just, don't do that. You know, I, I tell people to start like three seconds apart and then start ratcheting it up until you can, you see where your limits of your hardware are. So, you know, A, you know, just back it off. It's, it's our number one customer support thing is, is it doesn't work, it locked up, nothing's, nothing's right. Well, that's just back it off. I mean, I, I want to set expectations here of, you know, yes, the camera can do multiple frames a second, but just to start with, set it at three seconds apart, see how it works. Move it down to two seconds, one second, half second, ratchet it down until you see it work reliably. Um, focus is the other big thing people, you know, when you're rehearsing ahead of time, you're not usually focusing the camera. So you kind of build these uh, rote um, routines you're, you're familiar with and focus isn't necessarily one of them. So you need to take extra time to, to practice how to focus on the sun when it's not eclipsed and then make sure you've got plans for, you know, if, if the temperature's rapidly dropping and your lens is contracting and your sh focus shifts, you need to chase it. And then, you know, the other thing is removing the white light solar filter. So I hope everybody's using a safe solar filter and, you know, just being in awe of the eclipse and forgetting to take it off is a big problem a lot of people have. So I've got, and I'm sure Xavier has the same thing. You can have a voice prompt to tell you, take the filter off because you're going to, you're going to forget. And so just having that little chance for it to yell at you is a real important thing. Yes, I, I, I can say that uh, I did forget once uh, to remove the filters. And, uh, you know, I, I was just looking at the camera and saying, oh, it's it's all black and not understanding. And uh, the, uh, the when I understood, the eclipse was over. So it can really happen. Yeah. When we were working with the Citizen Kate project for 2017, where they had dozens of eclipse sites across the path with students running the setups, <laughs> excuse me, and amateur astronomers, and I was really trying to stress to them, look, you got to understand half of your people could forget to take the filter off unless you drill them on it. You know, at one time I was trying to talk them into some kind of mechanical, um, you know, like a flat field flap kind of a thing to, to take the filters off because it happens so much. Um, preparedness, the other thing, you know, we talk a lot about bracketing because there's a huge dynamic range between the Corona and the Bailey's beads and you got to hit every exposure time in between. And so you just, you got to try it all. You got to try all different, you don't know, there might be thin clouds coming through that extincts the, the images a little bit. You want to just cover the bases, run it all the way through. And then I encourage everybody to make a backup emergency script in case of clouds, because it can happen. You could, you know, you get a sucker hole that's only three seconds long. Well, I hope you get the perfect combination of exposures in that three seconds. And so I usually make a script that's just kind of hammering across maybe four different exposure times over and over and over so that if I get a little, you know, sliver of, of, of a clear sky, then I can get the pictures I need in that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about improvements and supports, and this is kind of a sore point I know a lot of people have is everybody's got great ideas. I love you guys. You got the most awesome ideas of things we could do with the software, but, you know, it's only me. It's only Xavier. Um, in my case, I own a giant solar filter company, which happens to be busy at the same time there are eclipses. And so I'm literally working 100 hours a week. I got four hours of sleep last night. I was here till, I think, 3.30 a.m., this morning. And so there just isn't free time available to go try all different camera brands and, and supporting cameras is really hard because they, each time the next generation comes out, there's something's different. You got to adapt to it and try this. And, and in most cases, that means I have to rent the camera, play with it, figure it out, may have to talk to the manufacturer, get a new SDK. And so it's, it's something I'm very, I've kind of had to make the decision. I'm just going to focus on Canon and Nikon because I'm only one person and I can't support all the different stuff. So you know, Xavier's got support for a lot more cameras. You know, if you've got an Olympus or other brands, it may be cheaper to go buy an old Mac laptop and run his software than to try to convince me to add support for your camera because I just, I don't have time. Um, I can say that I'm going to, I'm going to have a release soon with uh, updating Delta T. I'll put the latest Canon SDK in it, do a little house cleaning cleanup, and um, I'm hoping to add the Bailey's Beads animation to it. So I think this point I will fire up Eclipse Orchestrator and 
you would probably hear some dings of my camera turning on. So the software is very similar to Xavier's. <clears throat> Generally, when you fire it up the first time, you're going to want to set your location. You know, pick your observing site. I, I think this one is Carbondale, Illinois for the 2024. You know, hopefully you know generally where you're going. Enter that. If you have a GPS hooked up, you can click the take GPS button. And so this is where I'm sitting right this second, but this is where my observing site would be. So I'm not going to push take GPS because I'm not going to be here for the for the eclipse. And then the, the software will show me that, okay, at this Carbondale spot, the umbral duration is 4 minutes, 8.3 seconds. And if you were going to go to the actual center line, you'd actually lose two tenths of a second because of the shape of the moon. <laughs> Excuse me. Next thing you set up is the hardware um, configuration. That's where you pick your camera. So you drop down here and say, okay, I've got this camera hooked up. Give it a short name. This, you can type whatever you want here. Tell it what your lens focal length and aperture is. And um, I'm, quite a few people have trouble where camera won't show up here. That could be for any number of reasons, like a, a, a cable problem, if you've got some other application using the camera, if you've got uh, too many files on the chip and it's taking too long to load, there's, you know, sometimes we just have to work through it. Fred said one important thing is that uh, try to, in fact, have an empty memory card in the camera because if there are so, uh, too many pictures on the memory card, it may take like, you know, a minute, in fact, for the camera to be identified because the uh, sometimes the, all the, the, the pictures that are on the memory card have to be, in fact, read. Yeah. So, you know, as, as you're rehearsing, I mean, I hope you're going to rehearse this over and over and over. Part of that rehearsal should be emptying out the memory card before each run, because if you've got a thousand files on the card, that's going to not going to work very well for you. Um, down here, you can pick a GPS port. I've got a USB Garmin. Little hockey puck. This is my favorite. Garmin 18. Super dependable. Garmin 18X. And I've just got it sitting over near the window there so it can catch some GPS sunshine. So right now you can see we've got 10 satellites locked and, and my computer's clock is actually perfectly on time, which is what we want to see. Timing is, is a big problem. You know, if you're off by a couple of seconds on your computer's clock, that's, you could miss stuff. I mean, I've, I've twice I've traveled around the world for a 30 second eclipse. So you do have to have a plan for how you're going to sync the time on the computer. And, you know, if you've got a network connection, you can do NTP kind of updates. That's fine. But um, a hardware GPS is going to be much more dependable. Okay, so you got your, your camera set up. You've got your um, location set. We've got a plan for time. You know, the next thing is script wizard is the way a lot of people start right here. First thing under the file menu. And this is basically which eclipse, which camera, where are you going to be, rehashing some of the stuff you've hopefully already entered. Um, set some preferences. How, what's the longest exposure you want to allow the camera to take? So if you're going to an eclipse that's 30 seconds, I don't recommend a 30 second maximum exposure time. You know, we're we're lucky that this one coming up is four-ish minutes. So you could you could theoretically, if you want to get a deep earth shine kind of view of the face of the moon, you could go up to an eight second exposure or even longer to really get that um, aperture, ISO, what are your favorites? You know, certain cameras have a sweet spot for noise, um, you know, for processing later. So I generally use lower ISOs and then I'll take repetitive images and stack them just like you would with a, a nighttime uh, astrophotography. So there may be things where if you only, you have a short eclipse, you don't have a lot of time, you might want to bump your ISO up just so your exposure times come down. And then I always recommend raw file types. Um, I mean, raw plus a JPEG is the best if your memory card is fast enough, because then you can rip a JPEG off of there and post it to social media real quick. But raw is what you want to have for, for processing data later on. 
And then right here, you see this minimum spacing between exposures, three seconds. That's that's where I tell people to start. You know, you can set it. You notice it goes out to the second decimal point. So you can set it a lot smaller and if you've rehearsed it and you know what your hardware can do. All right, so we go next. This is the screen I showed earlier where you pick which phenomena. You know, we'll just, and we're, you could come back to this. I'll show you what to do there in a second. So we hit finish. It thinks about it for a minute. And then we see a script popped in in the bottom. So at that point, you can do a number of different things. You can edit it with the script editor. And this is a way to scroll down through and you can see what it's done. So it's got a 400th of a second, 200. It's just stepping down the line. It's got entries in here for the earth shine, stars, the, uh, the partial phases you see are right here. So if you want the partial phases with a different exposure time, you can just drop it down and fix it. And then you can click visualize here. And this is that graph. So we have brightness on the vertical axis and we have time on the horizontal. And what we can do is zoom in and see each little, maybe hard to see on some people's screens, but there's a black dot, which is the, um, the start of the exposure. And then the red bar is the length of it. So you can see just before second contact here, we've got um, some diamond ring photos followed by some Bailey's bead photos. And these little colored backgrounds are showing you the, the recommended exposure range for Bailey's beads, for diamond ring, for partial phases with the filter on. And then over here would be chromosphere prominences and the corona. Let me zoom out. So you can take a look at your script this way and you can see in this case, there's a hole where there's a few seconds where there's no pictures being taken. And so you could just go ahead and insert things in the script. So we could just go down here and, um, you know, anywhere basically you can insert, insert a line, insert pictures. You could also go back to the script wizard I'm just going to click through it click quickly here and you can say, okay, we've got more time. We can, we can bump up one of these other things, you know, like, okay, let's take more chromosphere pictures in that time. And then that'll help fill in that, um, that little dead time. So now we've got four pictures instead and looks like I could even afford another two or three in there. So this is, this is where you spend a lot of time just, just to look for stupid stuff, making sure you're not, you know, taking overlapping exposures um make sure it, it makes sense you're covering the, the gamut you know of, of brightness from bright to to dim and then at this point you know once you've built something that looks plausible it's time to try it so um you would go over here to camera hopefully you've, you've got the camera live and connected i've got i've got my 5d mark ii with a 100 to 400 lens right here and if i hit push shutter we should Hopefully be able to hear that click. We can also just fire off a, a setting of, you know, okay, I want to see, like if, you, if you're out on the sky and you're taking, you've got your filter on, just looking at an uneclipsed sun, you could screw around and figure out what exposure time it likes and, and take it with that. Um, there's also a global exposure compensation right here. So this is like, if you've got high thin clouds and it's making everything dimmer, you may want to bump up, you know, a certain number of stops to uh, fudge the numbers on eclipse day. So that's not something you would normally use. It, it'd be like if if you're having a bad day and it, there was a giant forest fire and you're looking through a ton of smoke and everything's too dim and, and you've done some test exposures and you know you're running dimmer than you should be, you could bump it up a certain number of stops to con compensate for that. Um, time, Xavier showed, you know, I've got simulated second contact. So I'll punch up my simulated view here, similar to what he's got. Right now it's showing we're 79 days from the eclipse. Let me tell you guys, this is terrifying because um, we've been getting ready for this for years and 79 days away. Holy crap. Um, so now we go simulate second contact. You hear the camera clicking away. 40 seconds to go. So on the screen here, you see we've got the GPS info, we've got the, the center line info, we've got the different contact times, you know, the most important parts. When does the sun seconds. rise? 30 seconds to go. All right. You hear it gave the voice prompt and and then you can see it also counting down here, 20 seconds. We've got altitude azimuth. Where's the sun in the sky? 
and then you should hear the camera start taking those photos we we programmed earlier so here it comes with the diamond ring 10 seconds 10 seconds to go and so how do you know if something's going wrong if you see the screen freeze that's bad if you see that the camera has an exposure that goes by that you don't hear the camera take a picture that's bad um you know one thing you could also do is after the script runs go look at the files on your memory card and see that they match what is programmed in the script make sure it didn't miss something um i've got a mode in here where we can i'm going to stop this for a second i've got a mode called incremental where you can tell the camera to only update the difference in the exposure or you can update everything so you see little incremental buttons here so what this means is only tell the program the camera about changes in exposure so like from this one to the next one the only thing that changed was the exposure time so don't send the iso don't send the aperture don't send the file type that makes that allows the camera to go quicker but you run the risk that say you've got a bunch of different isos different ex aperture settings it could if it misses one it doesn't get the update if you've got an incremental mode so you may want to have some that aren't incremental to kind of reset it all to a known state now and then all right so that's that's basically you know where you go set up your script i'm old school so i always use um we'll just save here I use notepad that's how I started writing every all of my scripts and so you can see it's just text you can you can just get in here change the text however you want change it I mean this might be a quick way to find and replace and and um, make mass changes to things and, and refine your script and reorganize things so I I prefer the text editor but I know a lot of people like the GUI editor more than that so there's just various ways to look at it like print out a list of when the exposures are going to take in exposure by exposure so you know you can just again it's another way to to look at it and and chart the data um we've covered the uh simulated let's go look at some of the toys over here so we've got simulated view this is the one i always keep up because this is showing what um what's going on with the sun we've got the map view this is probably going to take a minute to load up so i think i left it with the satellite view on 30 yeah. seconds 30 seconds to go and you can see the i'll switch it to um that was the duration filters yeah. off filters off so we've got the the shadow of the moon here and it's I'm going to stop that script real quick it's showing the shape of the moon is a little lumpy because that's that's the craters and valleys and mountains on the moon live view is here so if you want to start um practicing focusing let me see if I be able to see this we've got a light bulb in here and we can turn on the um uh, sharpness metric and so it's probably not going to work very well with me bouncing around here hopefully the number goes up as it gets sharper there you see we went from two thousands to four thousands as i focused it so that's a good way to on a clip state make sure you're you're um in the best focus you can be lunar limb profile i showed you this earlier you can move your mouse around and it'll tell you which crater that, that is or mountain or, or whatever um we've got the, the sky view so this is bring this in the center here so you can see the sun the planets you know the the zero first maybe second magnitude stars and then if we switch it to second contact you see the the shadow coming in in the southwest you know this is darker down here than up here and then third contact you see the shadow has moved up to the northeast this gets fun at the end of the eclipse path when the sun is pretty much overhead there's it's it's less of a interesting thing to do and you can just turn on off various things um let's talk about uh bailey's beads 
So this takes a little bit of time to compute. And so here, this is actually kind of a fun one here. You see in Carbondale, Illinois, this is third contact. And there's actually going to be in the last couple seconds, it's going to break up into multiple beads. This is, this is actually kind of pretty spectacular, I think, the way it's going to be. Let's go look at second contact. Given a minute to compute here. And so here you see it's it's a little bit tighter. So, you know, you have diamond rings. Some, a lot of times, classically, it's one crater and you get just down to one single point. And so this is a little bit more typical on the second contact. Third contact looks like a lot of fun, actually. I've had, I think, 2005, I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, west of the Galapagos Islands, and we had two giant separated beads. And it was it was really spectacular. And and so this is these are the things you can look out for and 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 tune your script. So you know we can see from this view that um, you know this is 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, 5, 2 seconds in. We we see the money shots are five to two seconds in. So we know to concentrate our our time. And sometimes you have to treat your camera's buffer like a bank and you know, don't blow all your money back here 30, 40 seconds away from from the, the the contact time you want might want to like especially at second contact you know kind of hold off until you're within that five ten seconds and then really hammer it hard because that's where it's interesting you don't necessarily i mean nobody really cares about a, a diamond ring photo 30 40 seconds away it's it's boring and then um this is the one thing where i'm going to work on animating this view um just because i think it it it'd help a lot of people visualize it to see it move through and and just how dynamic it's going to be so uh, i think we've covered that we've covered that uh solar radius um like xavier says 959.98 is what fits i mean i in 2017 i stayed home i was after i've been you know on all continents all over the world the path was coming through my backyard so of course i had to stay home so i could run all the gear and and I'm probably within just a few, I don't know, maybe three, four miles of the path edge. And I'd never been that close to the edge before. So I had a video running and I was shocked at how far off the prediction time was from when the Bailey's beads actually extincted. I mean, it was like five seconds. It was nuts. And that was because of this difference in solar radius. So this is, this is something that we've learned in the last few years and definitely use the the 959.98 that's that's going to match what everybody it, it, uh, gets um same thing Xavier's got refraction limb profile keep it on LRO that's the best down here is choose event so you're gonna you know whatever the next one is um I've had a lot of people asking me to to add a bunch more eclipses here so I'll work on that um I think uh there's some uh, sync the camera clocks to the PC clock. That's something you might want to do so that all the, the timestamps on the images are good. Uh, I've got some, there's two Canon SDKs. So there's the really old, the very first digital cameras use a different SDK than the, the current one. So you could switch it over if you've got one of those Stone Age, like 2005 and before cameras. Um, there's some other minor stuff in here nobody uses so i mean that's that's kind of the shape of it um uh you know i keep saying the three things you know don't don't program too many exposures too fast if you're having a problem any problem back off the number of exposures put more space in between and see what happens number two you're gonna forget to take a filter off so practice it you know get the voice prompt in the right place so that it reminds you um, you know, think about where you're going to put physically set your filter because you need to get it back on after third contact. So you don't want to have to be fumbling around. Oh, I dropped it in the grass. I got it dirty. You know, have a defined spot where you're going to set that filter. Um, uh, and then uh, focus is the other big one that gets everybody because, you, you know, when you're practicing scripts, you're not practicing focusing. So make a point of going out in the cold like it is right now. Focus on the sun. Get good at it. You know, bring the images inside, peep those pixels, you know, blow it up at 400%. Make sure you got the absolute best focus you can be and what it takes to get there. And then just be cognizant that if 
if it is a good deep eclipse, you might have a temperature drop during the eclipse, especially with, with uh, telescopes instead of camera lenses, you could get a pretty significant focus shift and, and you may have to chase it. And so that's, you know, then that's a tricky one of when do you do the last update of your focus? You don't want to do that a minute before totality because you're going to, you're going to be, and you're going to screw it up and make it worse. So, you know, think about how long does it take you to, to do a patient good focus? You know, is that five minutes before totality, 10 minutes before totality? And then um, at that point, go hands off. And, and I would also encourage people to not screw around. And, and I mean, I've had a lot of times where your, your perception is kind of weird on eclipse day. You're, you're caught up in the moment. Everybody's screaming and happy. There's tension, there's excitement. And it's easy to kind of like not understand what's going on. So you, you may think your camera's not working. Like, why don't I see pictures on the screen? Well, that's because it's connected to the computer. Maybe the screen doesn't come on when it's connected over USB. So, you know, you may look at your computer, your camera and go, oh shoot, there's nothing on the screen. It's, it's not working. I'm not getting anything. What do I do? Oh crap. You got to extinct those fears. You got to, um, be sure to keep your emotions under control, not worry about it, trust in your rehearsals and, and, you know, test, test, test. Don't wait to the last minute. I mean, I just, I, it breaks my heart when I come back from an eclipse and there's a voicemail full of somebody, you know, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. I, I didn't try it till I was on the plane and it doesn't work. And I don't, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, I can't deliver a, a driver file to you. It, you know, when I'm in the middle of Africa and you're in the middle of Australia. So, um, you know, uh, you know, we'll do the best we can with, with chasing down bugs or anything, but you know, it's up to you guys to really rehearse everything and check it out. So I think at that point, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. If anybody wants to, you know, see a specific feature or has a question or a problem, just let me know. Sure, I got Fred, a question. Fred, as host, I have a few questions. I'm going to go first. All right. That's I'm your guy, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm a guy to plan all this. So here we go. Uh, so Fred, um, I, I'm still running the same version of EO that I had in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to upgrade for 2023 because I figured if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Is it worth upgrading, doing any minor upgrades for, for this eclipse? Or should I stick with the version I got? Um, I think you'd want to check your leap second setting and the delta T time because those have probably changed since then. So just make sure that you're not going to end up, you know, a second off or two seconds off. So you could look in the, um, oh boy, this is going to be hard for me to dig in and find on this computer. So there's settings for the Baselian elements. Maybe actually if I go show the Baselian file. Do, 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 do. Sorry, guys, I haven't looked in this bit for a little bit. So there's a setting in here, which is the number of leap seconds and the delta T time. And you'd want to make sure, like if if you you could download the latest version of EO and use the Bicellians from the new version, just plug it into your old version. That'd be perfectly fine. Okay. And do I get free upgrades when I per when I purchased it previously? Or is there a small fee yeah. of upgrade? There's there's no upgrade fee. Okay. Um, yeah. It's it's and there's no plans to charge again for it. So, it, it, you know, I'm not in this for the money. Um, right. You know, we, the, the, the $109 fee is basically it funds renting cameras to test them. Yeah. And can you focus when the script is running? You can you use a live focus when, when you're running um, the script? Or you have to kill the script. No, no, I would, I would close the script and then open the live focus. I wouldn't recommend uh, usually, you know, when you're, if you've got like during the eclipse, you've got partial phases, those are, those images are usually like a minute apart. And so you've got time there to um, just stop the script, open the live view, do your focus, turn it back on. And like, if you practice it, you can do that in 30 seconds and, and have time and you won't miss anything. Okay, great. I think that's it for now. Let's, so, so I'll let somebody else go. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, when the temperature is dropping, any chance of throwing a dew heater on there? I am don't think I've ever had dew problems anywhere I've been. But, but the temperature dropping, the dew heater will keep the temperature back up. Just under the band, though, not for the whole yeah. like the lens. Yeah, not the whole tube. And then, you know, you wouldn't get dew, but um, the, yeah, I think that's, that's a good point because the dew heater's up front. It's not going to affect the body of it. 
just on a camera and a yeah, I, I, if it's a short lens, like maybe a you know little fifty millimeter or hundred millimeter lens, it might be short enough to help. But um, and it, it's not every eclipse that has a big temperature drop. It kind of depends on the the weather and the the area you're in. You know, if if it has a thermal mass or not. You could potentially then get the gold foil mylar sheets for the rescue blankets, mm -hmm. and wrap your camera in that, and that will stop it cooling down. So won't if so if there it like during a long duration it will it'll bleed off heat. But if you wrap it with a th with the thermal foil that like um, for the rescue blankets, that will actually decrease the heat bleeding off your camera and sustain its temperature. Sounds like a good idea. Go ahead, John. Uh I just saw that you had a four hundred millimeter lens in your test script over here and yeah. you just talked about a fifty. Um is there any recommended particular full frame? Um, sensor, not a, not a crop frame that you prefer? Um, honestly, I've stuck with my Canon 5D Mark II because there's nothing wrong with it. And that that's a full frame camera. I like that one. Um, yeah, I meant lens. Yeah, lens I've used. Uh, the 400 is the one I use when I'm traveling. Um, I've liked the, I've used an AT111. That's about 700 millimeters. That's pretty good on a full frame chip. Um, I wouldn't go I don't think I'd go over a thousand millimeters in focal length because that would get pretty tight and your tracking have to be pretty good. It, it can be hard to set up a, a polar alignment in daytime. And so yeah. um, you all you can do is drift alignment. So I encourage people to not get too crazy high power. I, I had lunch with Fred Espinak and he gave advice on that. And he said, you know, given the sun's a half a degree, he said in the short direction of the sensor, uh, the sun should be no smaller than a quarter of the height of the sensor but no bigger than a half of the height of the sensor. And that, and that was sort of the sweet spot to get some Corona in there. Sure. Yeah. And, it, and that depends on what you're going for, you know, because like if you're doing Bailey's beads work, you can go in a lot tighter. If you're doing uh, just the earth shine, you know, you could be tighter, but yeah, for Corona stuff, definitely that's a good, good advice. And, and I've been shocked. Thank sometimes you. People have done much wider photos and gotten Corona way out there. If the, the sky was transparent in them. Hmm. That's just shocking. Thank you. Yep. You, you so, find several folks. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you, do you find a performance difference between uh, DSLRs and mirrorless? Um, yeah, the mirrorless would would do better. Obviously, you know, we we struggle a lot with the the cycle time of the shutter on the on the old ones. And, you know, that's where we would play a lot of games with locking the mirror up and um, trying to trying to optimize it. So, yeah, the, the mirrorless would be a lot more dependable option. And in, my, in my case, not really. Okay. Uh, because, you know, when, I, when uh, uh, the mirror is, you know, kept up, then uh, more or less it's equivalent to a mirrorless uh, camera. Uh, okay, so I've I've hooked up the D810 Alpha, and I don't get any picture or live view on the back, which is something that I uh, sort of depend on when I shoot eclipses, and so that's why I was asking. It appears that on the Z7, for example, you do get the uh, the picture on the back of the camera, which is seems to be helpful. Uh, a, a related question is, as far as performance, when you add this additional serial cable that goes into the separate port for a wired shutter, uh, a manual shutter, uh, does that introduce any um, potential downsides? And what exactly is the upside? The, the upside is, you know, you're, you're triggering the hardware shutter. It's as if you're pushing the, the button on the camera. And in my experience, that's much more reliable. Um, it's it's kind of like the camera is built to respond to that that shutter click of your finger. That's what the, you know, the firmware prioritizes over everything else. So when you're using that, serial, we call it a serial cable, but it's not using the serial direct to the camera. It's, it's triggering the remote shutter port. And so it, it seems to be a lot more reliable. It seems like you can go faster with it. You can, you can hold it down. You can um, get better timing out of it. It just, 
the the downside is it's one more cable it's one more thing to forget um so it's it's your own personal risk tolerance as to whether you use it okay thank you yep. okay we have some people that are politely raising their virtual hand so we'll yep. try some of those so uh robert you had a question you had your hand raised there hmm. robert slobbins go ahead I guess not. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, Tim, did you have a question? Yeah, You're sure. Uh, so I do, I do have uh, um, one question, but there was one thing that you didn't mention that, that Fred Espinak mentioned to me, which was if you're, you're going to use a teleconverter, he said, before the day of the eclipse, go out and find a crescent moon at night and shoot that deliberately overexposed six to 10 shots because a lot of teleconverters create internal reflections. And so on the day of the eclipse, it may spoil your shot. But mm -hmm. my, my question was on focus, which was uh, with the solar filter on and you've got it focused and you take the solar filter off, do you notice much of a, a focus shift? Do I need to worry about that? Uh, did you buy a cheap Chinese one or did you buy a... <laughs> uh, Bader film. Yeah, that, that one's fine. Yeah, any of the okay. thin film ones won't affect focus. If you've got a glass filter made by a, a disreputable source, then you may have a focus shift. Excellent. Thank you. Bob Myrican. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Robert, you want to try again? You need to unmute, maybe? Yeah. Richard, you might be able to, un to unmute him uh, in the controls. I can ask him to unmute, but we got to move, so we, we don't have time. Uh, Michael Hello. Monahan, go ahead. How's it going? Uh, I just want to thank you guys for your time tonight. It's, it's been really cool to hang out uh, for about two hours with a bunch of people in our niche little hobby. Uh, yeah. I really want to thank Xavier. He got me this awesome shot uh, in 2017, and I, I really would encourage everybody to, you know, if you want to see a feature – to both Fred and Xavier donate. Uh, you know, I was able to donate to Xavier and he's working on getting my camera compatible. Uh, you know, maybe he'll release it for everyone. It's for a Nikon Z8. I know a lot of people were asking about that in uh, in the chat. Um, but my question really comes on, on glass solar filters. How would you guys um, be able to adjust for, you know, I, at least in my testing with solar filters, I've seen a lot of variability in uh, how much light each solar filter lets through, uh, even some slight variation between the exact same filters. Is there any like consistent way you guys have to like either test for that or maybe try to get a solar filter that really only lets through one amount of light? I, I just wonder if you guys had any input on that. Um, you know, we make solar filters, so we struggle with this every single day. Um, yeah. You know, the one of our frustrations right now is the ISO standard for eclipse classes has an incredibly tight uniformity standard. Of, I think it's 10%. And that's causing a huge problem for the industry to be able to make film that that with that tight of a uniformity across the, the frame for eclipse classes. So, you know, we struggle with this every day. And, you know, as far as is it ND 4.8, is it ND 5.1? You know, there's no industry standard as far as, as what it's supposed to be, you know a lot of people will say ND5. Well, is it ND5.0 or is it ND5.4 rounded down to ND? There's no way to know. You know, I suppose you're paying for things. You know, does the manufacturer specify that it's ND4.9 to ND5.1? Well, that tells you something. But otherwise, the only thing you can do is go shoot the, the uneclipsed sun, look at your exposure times as compared to what they should be. Like, you know, I always used Fred Espinac's guide and his old Eclipse bulletins. And so he he would give you, it's basically a Q value of what the brightness should be and what the exposure time the ISO and aperture, you know, math mathematically works out to. And you can compare your setup to what he says, and that'll give you an idea of where you're at and you, you can extra, adjust your exposures. And, and, you know, but that's one reason why I say bracket, 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 because you just don't know. You could do all that work of figuring out that your, your filter is an ND 5.03, and then a cloud comes through on Eclipse Day and everything's off. So, you know, just, just running it through the, the gamut to get you what you need to, to process later is the best way to handle that. Yeah, I, I agree with Fred. Uh, I mean, the only filter that I... I say is reliable um, on the uh, on the ND value is the the Bader uh, Miller film. All the others, there is a huge uh, variance. So you can buy one, 
And then two months later, you buy another one, same brand, same maker, and well, you have a, a stop difference. So it, it, it's a challenging thing to make. I mean, yeah. we've we've been struggling to make in canal glass solar filters here. And you know, we actually took orders for some at some point because we were so close to getting it working. But in the end, you know, we we refunded those folks because we would get the we could hit the uniformity, we could hit the ND number, and then there'd be like two pinholes in the filter. You just can't have pinholes in your filter, right? And so it's like we've got all these different variables we're trying to control. We're trying to control the in canal thickness. We're trying to control the the cleanliness, the the thickness, the the wavefront uniformity. It's like, and for a hundred bucks, we just we can't hit all the numbers perfect enough. So, you know, we're, we're only like us right now, we're only selling the film filters. Personally, I don't like the botter film as much because it's silver on the inside. And if you have a light leak um, around the, the edge of your filter that could reflect in and kind of do some weird things during the partial phases. So, you know, if you've got that kind of film, just make sure it's, it's totally light tight around the front of your scope. Daryl Rogers, go ahead with your question. Yes, so several of uh, the people in the chat and myself um, are having issues getting the live view to show an image for a couple of different Nikon um, cameras, mine specifically the D7500. Are there any anything that we should be looking for in our settings to help us to get that live view working? Um, either it works or it doesn't. I've, I've heard of this issue reported and I've never been able to track it down. It seems like the certain generations or, or or models of cameras handled it a little bit different and i haven't been able to figure that out yet uh, so. i can answer i mean the the live view uh, structure is uh, different slightly different so i know i know i think uh, the d yeah uh, um, 7500 yes i think uh, the d 780 i think also um and i mean the new uh z series uh cameras also as well i mean there, there are some differences okay so so likely not going to get it to work and so i should not not think about that choice i think as far as eclipse orchestrator it's something i've looked at and not had success fixing so you know it would it would be better to look for you know the the good thing is digital cameras have been good for quite a while now. So even if you buy an older one that that might work better for just for this purpose and then sell it after the eclipse might be one strategy. Thank you. In my case, I think it does work. Now, if it doesn't, uh, well, you have to let me know. Christy so. Whittington, go ahead, please. Thank you both for basically being one man show to put this together over the years and years. Uh, my question is, is there a best place to get support from everybody else? Is there a forum on Cloudy Nights or a Reddit or something like that where we can learn from each other and prep for the next eclipse? For Orchestrator, we don't, I think we used to have a Yahoo group, but you know, that got shut down and I, I was too busy to start up in uh, groups.io or anything like that. So, you know, we're, we're really struggling with support right now. We've got Tiffany who answers the phones and she can do basic stuff. And, and handle a lot of, you know, general stuff. But otherwise, no, I don't know of any user user for, for orchestrator. Xavier can talk for his side. Yeah, well, personally, I had um, uh, yeah, a small, you know, BBS uh, forum. But, uh, I mean, for the past few years, um, things have been difficult on my side. So, yeah, again, it's, um, it's nearly impossible. Also, I mean, sometimes people are asking so many questions that uh, you would need the staff of a few people to answer everything. Oh yeah, I wouldn't expect um, you guys to answer. I would expect everybody else to give their experiences in. Yeah, I know, I know. But you know, the problem is again, uh, I mean, some people, I don't know why, but they always, you know, ask uh, crazy questions. Then sometimes they make crazy suggestions and then, you know, just, you know, blows off and there is nothing you can do and and you have no time you know to be behind and to check to read everything I impossible yeah i i know at daystar we struggle with people getting on cloudy nights or whatnot and spewing absolute falsehoods and it it's it's there's no malice it's just somebody misheard something and then that gets passed along and, and perverted into something else and 
pretty soon people are saying, oh, they can't make the filters anymore. Well, that's that's not true. We've made, you know, hundreds this week. So, you know, it, it's hard for us to to be in or be out, right? You know, because either we got to be in there watching everything and correcting every little, you know, misinformation or, or misstatement or or we just have to ignore it. So I I don't know really how to solve this. You know, it, one of the things I really don't like right now is that I can't support everybody all the time who needs it. I just, there aren't 10 of me to, to answer the phones all day long. I don't know what to do about it. I, th I think you both need a little, there's a t-shirt that I used to have. It says, I can only please one person a day. Today is not your day and tomorrow doesn't look good for you either. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, Robert. Robert, do you want to go ahead and try now? <laughs> Yes, Third can time's everyone hear, can yes, everyone we, hear me? Yes, we, we can, can hear, hear you. Ahead. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is, you know, I've been a user of uh, Solar Eclipse Maestro since 2012, I believe. Um, and I've had, I've had my uh, ups and I've had my downs. And, you know, you keep on learning um, over time, um, especially the concept of having the serial cable uh, connected to another USB port. Okay? Robert, let's get with the question, please. Excuse me. Question, please. Go ahead. All right. First thing, are all the Nikon mirrorless cameras covered in either platform, SEM or EO? They should work for EO. I haven't tested very many of them. Okay. So I was thinking of a, of a Z8 or a Z7, Z6, 1s and 2s, Z5s. I don't know about the FCs. Okay. I guess... I pays my money, I takes my chances then. Second thing, how many with Z EO? Z7 hmm? will work. I, I believe the Z7 II, though, is automatically shifted from raw into JPEG fine. Yeah, but that, that's now fixed in, 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 in uh, the latest uh, beta version. In the beta version? Yes, yes. It's identified as. Sorry? You muted yourself, Greg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not identified as private. I thought it said private, so I I, uh, I didn't know. Well, the okay. Z, a UZ7 is cheaper than a Z, UC7, too. we got to keep on some budget here. Um, I'm okay with that. And the D850s are supported. That, that should work fine, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to test everything using the GPS, and I could do it from here in Chicagoland where there will be a total solar eclipse in 2099. It will be total right here. It would be nice for me to duplicate, to, to, to test the setup on that eclipse. Is that, how can I make that available so I can run everything, run a script to make sure that the GPS and the cameras, two, two on a machine, will play with each other well. In other words, I wouldn't end up with any uh, obstruct, you know, any com any contention that would bring it that would stop pro all processing. Well, you just have to select the eclipse, uh, plug in the GPS, uh, set the time, simulate the time, and that's it. I mean, there is no. I simulate the time, but to get to the point where. I'm getting that this particular eclipse that's going to happen in 2099 just for testing purposes. I I don't remember if if I go um, up to 2099, I would need to check. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I mean, you just need to add the best elements, and that's it. Okay, okay. I, I I'll be in Tardion. A week before, you know, from the uh, from the first of April, so I would have time to run, do a dress rehearsal from the hotel. So I expect to do something like that, make sure we don't end up we uh, that everybody plays together, plays well together. Um, All right, uh, let's go ahead and get the next question. And uh, Rick Galloway, go ahead and ask your question, please. Okay, real real quick, Xavier. I hope your health issues get resolved very very quickly. My question is. A number of people have asked you for updates with the various newer cameras, mirrorless, et cetera. Uh, I know because I've been one of the ones who've pestered you over the last few months. I was just, my question is, do you expect to release a smaller update 
for solar eclipse maestro within the next 30 to 60 days or so yes i i hope um late later this month for early february great thank you all right grady uh great <laughs> let me put Post something in the uh, chat there, and let me just do a few uh, plugs for the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society here. So just, Robert, Robert, please, please, uh, oh, please, please. Okay, so we have the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series going. Uh, we just had part one last Saturday. Uh, part two is this coming Saturday, January 27th. Um, if you have not registered, you can follow the link in the chat and register for the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series. Part two, of course, as you can see, is on discovering the night sky, which is basically everything you can see in the sky with just your eyes alone, basically day or night. I got to work on that title. And uh, our, our, our eclipse series continues on Friday, February 2nd at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And our very special guest, uh, again, is Dr. Michael Zeller, who you may know better as the Mr. Great American Eclipse.com guy. So uh, we all know Michael Zeller. We all know his website and his fantastic maps. Uh, hopefully, he'll be joining us here in Kalamazoo, weather permitting. Uh, but if you can't join us in Kalamazoo at the Math and Science Center, uh, you are more than welcome to join us on Zoom. So again, follow the link in the chat. Uh, to register. And many of you know we have a very nice remote telescope in Arizona, so please join us for our online viewing session. This is the last of the season, by the way, on February 3rd at 9 o'clock. Again, that's Eastern Standard Time. And basically, for about two hours, we just take a tour of the night sky with the telescope in Arizona uh, virtual or uh, on Zoom. So it's basically like your EAA, your Electronically Assisted Astronomy session. And of course, uh, the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society is selling its eclipse shades on its website and in, in our little shop called the Sky Shop. And so, of course, you can purchase eclipse shades from us for $3 a pair. Um, re remember, we're an astronomy club. We don't get tax money. We're not a profit group. We don't get endowments. Uh, be uh, besides member dues, this is the only way we have to really help our budget to uh, bring us to, to bring you activities like this and to help maintain our facilities. So there's just a quick plug for various things for the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. So again, I want to thank uh, Xavier and Fred for joining us. Fred, uh, uh, I, I hope you feel, feel feel fine, but Xavier, I hope you get out of the hospital real soon. So again, yep. I just want to thank everyone for joining <laughs> us for the astrophotography uh, SIG group and this uh, installment of the Eclipse series. Thanks again.